John chapter 9. Appreciate y'all coming out. It's good to be here, amen? I don't like, I don't like missing church. It's not, my, it's not my DNA. It's not my blood. No, no. I'm, I, he asked me if I was being a politician, gone all the time. I said, no, I'm more like Johnny Carson. Yeah. And getting a full-time salary. Uh, some people won't get that joke, that Johnny Carson joke. I get it. Yeah. Roy, there wasn't anything before your time. Amen to that. John chapter 9. We had a, um, had a good meeting down in Pea Ridge, Arkansas, good preacher's meeting. And like I said, God just kind of worked messages out to where I didn't hear the last two, uh, Melissa, but Melissa and John, but they, they stayed. And, um, but we'll, we'll get them in on video uh, whenever they get them uh, put on video and duplicated. Uh, I need to remember to send them my copy. Uh, down there so they can pack it together and send it out to the various people that sign up for it But it was just good. It was just good preaching. I need preach to preached at and uh, Meeting some people that are our friends and been friends for years with these people. We love them. We thank God for them and um, God God will give you a good family. Amen If you seek him out God will give you a family to be a part of and even if you weren't born in the same bloodline as they were, God would give you... Actually, we were. We were born in the bloodline of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> That's what makes us... Fa That's why we call each other brother and sister. And don't call me father. Don't... That's why you're not supposed to call men father. Because they didn't sire you. God the Father did that. Amen. Yeah, no, not Padre, not, not none of that. I will say, however, back in my Bible college days, having a sense of humor and thinking I could never get in trouble for anything I did, I went into a, um, it was a sort of a big ecumenical Christian bookstore in the Oklahoma City area. And I found a shirt with a little white collar for a Catholic priest. Black shirt, little, little white deal in the front. Well, I bought that rascal. And I had more fun wearing that shirt. I had on black pair of pants, black shirt with a little white deal here. And you'd be surprised at the looks you got from people. Here comes a holy reverend. And I was, um, I had in a, a sort of like a pastor's helper's job in McAllister, Oklahoma, which is about 120 miles away from where I went to college. And every weekend I'd drive down there on Friday afternoon, stay with the pastor for the weekend and, and worked with the choir, worked with the youth, worked with the pastor, you know, it's just kind of getting some training in and be an assistant to him and everything like that. And you're tra on the way back Sunday night after church, I'd come driving back. Well, you're going through all these little sleepy Oklahoma cow towns, kind of like driving through Fredericktown, okay? And of course, you know, in these little sleepy towns, they've always got a little quick stop with some uh, booths in them for people to eat the fried chicken that they sell in there and you know the hot dogs and everything and there was a, I on the way back coming back one night I in the car I took my other shirt off and I put on that priest shirt and I selected me a convenience stop to stop at and just see what kind of reaction I got as I was walking in I noticed there was person behind the counter and I noticed that there was uh, two guys and a lady sitting at this booth smoking cigarettes and they had a little beer in front of them you know and which they're not supposed to do that if they sell packaged liquor you can't sit there and drink it it's against law but that's what they were doing anyway 
And uh, as soon as I walked in the door, I could, I could see they were all talking and laughing. As soon as I walked in the, dar, in the door, you heard crickets. They stared at me. I went back, got a bottle of Pepsi and a, and a Snickers candy bar, which was my favorite thing. I should have got a thing of Budweiser, but wasn't old enough. But anyway, I got a Pepsi and a Snickers candy bar. And the lady's going, sir, is there anything else you want, sir? Sir, can I help you with it? Find anything else? No, I'm good. Well, thank you very much, sir. Thank you for coming in, sir. Have a good evening, sir. You know, and I'm walking out. And I walk out the door and I catch the people at the booth sitting there going. <laughs> laughing their head off. I, there ain't no telling what they were talking about before I walked in. They see me walk in like a Catholic priest and all of a sudden. <laughs> the reverence here. So I had I had me a little fun with that. All right, John chapter 9. It's good to have you with us tonight, those of you online. You could, you could just imagine me wearing a little priest deal, okay? Having fun with it. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Um, we've still got some people recovering from COVID, so pray for them as they climb slowly out of that hole and uh, lift them up before the Lord. Um, I don't have a, Rose, I'm going to need a prayer list before we get out of here tonight. Um, a lady called me today, wants us to pray for her son, who is, uh, apparently he's heavy into drugs, and they're having a tough time with him, wanted us to pray for him, so we'll, we're, I told her I'd do that, I prayed today. Uh, for him and you pray for him tonight but let's go to the lord in prayer and ask his blessings on his word heavenly father we love you thank you lord god for the ability to come back into your house tonight and uh, be with our people lord and fellowship and love one another and uh, lord i'm i just i hate it lord when we can't get together and this virus thing lord is god everybody's scared but Father, what it's doing, it's if the devil meant it to harm the church, what it's actually doing is helping the true church. Because your true people, Lord, realize that they don't like being home when it should be church day. And I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would just bless your people. And Lord, just put it, burn it in our hearts, God, that it's, it is, we are nearing the last days. We are, we do see the day approaching. And so let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but help us, dear God, to be an encouragement to one another, a blessing to one another, a help to one another. And Father, we just, Lord, ask you, God, to just visit with us tonight. Send your Holy Spirit down here, Lord, through your word, that it would comfort our hearts and give us patience and teach us love, teach us how to be like Jesus. Open our eyes that we may see and behold wondrous things out of your law, David said. And Lord, we pray, dear God, that you would open our eyes and help us to behold these wonderful things in your word tonight. Bless those who are still sick. Lord, give them uh, healing and recovery. And I pray, dear God, that you would bless folk, Lord, that are watching around the country, around the world tonight. Pray, Father, that we could be a blessing to them always as a church. Use us for your, your name, your glory, your kingdom, your word's sake. Use us for that and that only. May you receive the glory and the praise and the credit and the, and the hallelujahs, Father, as we join together in worship, praying, singing, Studying your word. Visit with us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. John chapter 9. Um, I, don't, I don't quite remember what the last thing was we talked about in, um, in John 8. I, I'm not sure. I couldn't remember if we finished that or not. But... Um, I see something here I want to I look at. Wow. 
Boy, do I ever want to look at that. Go back to John chapter 8. And um, let's see here. Let's, look, let's pick it up in um, verse 39 of John chapter 8. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Hi, I didn't see you come in. Um, if you were Abraham's children, you would, do the, you would do the works of Abraham. If you were of the seed of Abraham, you would be like Abraham. I, I don't know if I've, if I've picked them up because I saw my dad do them. But I have some of the mannerisms of my father. I have them. I know my dad. I, I used to look up to him, watch him every day. And he just did things a certain way, talked a certain way, walked a certain way, saw things a certain way, and so on. And I know his mannerisms. And the older I get, I see those mannerisms coming out of me. I'm just like my father. I don't know, like I said, I don't know if I'm actually just have seen that and subconsciously are trying to mimic my dad or it's actually some genetic thing or combination of both, doesn't matter. But I am, I see myself being like my earthly father is what I'm trying to say. And that's what Jesus was saying here. But he said, verse 40, but now you seek to kill me. A man that hath told you the truth, which I, have, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. Abraham wouldn't have killed me, wouldn't have tried to kill me. And he said, you do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication, we have one father, even God. And Jesus is about ready to smack them right across the teeth with something. And he said uh, unto them in verse 42, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Hold your place right there. Go back to uh, Genesis chapter 4. Very quickly, we have two brothers here in Genesis 4. Who are they? Who are they? Cain and Abel. Now, for what reason does Cain hate Abel? What reason? What reason does he hate him? Jealousy. Jealousy, because he's doing something... And God's accepting it, and God's rejecting what Cain's doing, and it has to do with the sacrifice. Cain is, grab, is gathering his sacrifice from the ground. But it, the Bible sort of gives this idea that Cain was of that wicked one, and he's just, it's sort of like he's just performing a ritual with no faith. And God is rejecting his deeds, because he's wicked. But Abel's is being accepted before God. And Cain, and I, I, you know, I preached on hatred Sunday morning. Probably should have uh, used this more of, of an illustration than anything. But Cain hated his blood relative, his blood brother. Why? Because of jealousy. He hated him and hated him so much that he figured, well, if I just kill Abel and get rid of him, then God will have no choice but to accept me. And um, I tell you, there's in the animal kingdom. Why do two bucks fight in November? Why do they? Yeah. Yeah. It all has to do with rage, jealousy over woodlands, territory. They mark their territory with their scent. And it has to do with rights over who can mate with the does. 
It's like that in a large portion of the animal kingdom. Males will fight each other to the death over jealousy rights, over rights to have this, rights to have that, so on and so on and so on. And just about every war in the world, that's at the core of it. It's jealousy. It is saying, I want what you have and you won't give it to me. Therefore, I'm going to come in. I'm going to kill every one of you and I'm going to steal it away from you. That way there's no choice, but it's going to come to me. And uh, so Jesus then says in verse 43, back at John 8, Why do you not understand my speech even because you cannot hear my word? And he says in verse 44, here it is right here. You have your father, the devil. Bet that got him. Ye are of your father, the devil. Does the Bible, is there a backup to that? Turn to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Look at verse 37. He's going to give the explanation of the parable of the wheat and the tares. Um, and he says, he answered, in verse 37, he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, which are people that are born again. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Now, I've read things where it said, ah, see, that, that proves it right there, that God hates all black people, and he hates Jews, and he hates Hispanics, and he hates everybody that has dark skin. He only likes white people. But in verse 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Um, the tares are the children of the wicked one. Look at verse 41. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels and they shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. That's who the children of the devil are. It's those who live their life for sin and sin alone. They are of their father, the devil. They are of that wicked one. Just like Cain was. So back in John chapter 8, verse 44, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. And think about, think about the picture that we're looking at in Genesis 4 of Cain killing Abel. Jesus just told us that Satan was the one who initiated that, I believe, in Cain's mind. Was Cain possessed of Satan? It's possible. It's possible. The Bible doesn't come outright and say it. It just says Cain, who is of that wicked one. And some people want to try to inject this idea that Satan mated with Eve and produced Cain. But the Bible does not say that. In fact, it says the exact opposite. It says that Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived a child and she brought forth Cain and she said, the Lord hath given me seed or I've gotten a man child from the Lord or something like that. At no time does the Bible ever say that Satan engaged with Eve and conceived Cain. But whether by possession or by temptation, Satan clearly put the idea of murdering Abel into Cain's mind, which is why he did it. Because Satan was a murderer from the beginning. And so now he says, um, verse 44 again, you are your father the devil and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. So now in this book, the book of John, we're, we see in the Gospels that Satan enters into who? Judas Iscariot. 
He enters directly into Judas Iscariot, takes him over, possesses his body. And Judas then departs from the other 11 disciples and Jesus and goes and be, and gathers the, gets the 30 pieces of silver, uh, for turning Jesus into the authorities. And you know the rest of the story. And he had him killed. He had Jesus Christ killed. He had him murdered. So that's Genesis 4 is a foreshadowing of that event. And Satan is present in both of those places. I believe that he just sort of pushed Cain or was in Cain doing those deeds through him to kill his brother. But we know for a fact that Satan entered into Judas Iscariot and caused Judas Iscariot to do what he did to have Christ killed on the cross. But see, all of that was the work of God, wasn't it? Sure it was. And so he says again in verse 44, he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. The spirit that generates lies is the devil. The people that tell them will be held accountable. But Satan's the father of all lies. He's the father of all false doctrines and false Bibles, false religious creeds, false doctrine, false prophets, false teachers, false brethren. He's the father of all of them. And verse 45, and because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? In other words, can any of you pin a sin on me that you know that I've committed? Can anybody do it? And none of them could. And so he says, and if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. And I said this down in Pea Ridge. God's words sound like heareth. And thee, and thou, and thine, and thus. That's what God's word sounds like to us. Amen? So if you go visit a church somewhere, and the preacher gets up, or whoever the guy or the woman is, or whatever, and they start quoting Bible verses, and you don't hear if, at the end of some of those words that you're used to hearing that in, get up, get out of there. You're in the wrong church. You're in the wrong place. So, again, verse 47, He that is of God heareth God's words, ye therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. Now, what does that tell you about those Christians, or those people who call themselves Christians? I'll call them pew members. They belong to a pew. They got their pew marked. <laughs> it was kind of funny, because... The Pea Ridge Church, just like Bethel. Everybody that goes to church there has got their pew marked. How do, they, how do we here have our pew marked, Alicia? Blankets, pillows. Yeah. But no spit tunes. We're not going that far. And no wet bar. Yeah. I know it. Um, verse 48. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? You see, they just, they didn't know the truth. They're just pew members who don't know the truth. And when you tell them the truth, they hate it. They hate it. And the reason why they hate it is because God is not in them. Brother Mike Hutzel and I were reminiscing about that time we were in Kilimanjaro. And I had set the, the teaching up all week to lead to this conclusion that 
there was good Bibles and bad Bibles. And they, those people needed to know the difference. And when I researched their Swahili Bible, I found out that the Catholic Church had gotten involved in it and had, and had messed it up. And when I showed them that the Son of God was not in their Swahili Bible in Daniel 3.25, but a Son of the Gods was Moana wa Miyungu, they got angry. And Pastor Kilonzo, the, the elder past, pastor, godly man, a godly man. Now, at that point, he had a choice because I was laying it out and I was telling these people, your Bible is wrong. I'm telling you, your Bible is wrong. That pastor could have stood up right then and said to Mike Hutzel, I don't know where you found this guy, this Mzungu from America, but you can take him right back where you found him. I'm not going to listen to that stuff. This is our, this is our language, and this is what we speak, and this is our Bible, and you're not going to tell me any different. But that's not what he did. Because God was in his heart, the Holy Ghost was in his life. That man, as soon as he saw what I was getting at, the Holy Ghost convinced him that what I was saying was right. And he jumped up and he said, I realize I've been preaching out of a book, but I've not been preaching out of the word of God. And that. I didn't know this, but Mike Hutzel said they had a Bible burning at that church. Burnt all their corrupt Bibles. I didn't know that. I wished I could have got in on that. Mm -mm -mm. Verse 50, I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judges. Uh, I preached... To the people at Pea Ridge, and it's on the internet now, wolves in sheep's clothing. And I, I'm, I, I wasn't saying that everybody who does one of these things wrong is a wolf. But sometimes we learn wolfish ways. And whenever you see a preacher, pastor, evangelist, prophet, or whatever who you can tell is seeking his own glory. You can tell it. There's a pastor, there's a picture, several pictures of Dr. Owar in Kenya. He's a false prophet over there with people who are literally bowed down to him, giving him obeisance and reverence. That's evil. That's absolutely evil. That man is Seeking his own glory. Not even Jesus would do that. Not even Christ did that. And I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead in the prophets. And thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead, which makest thou thy thyself? Jesus answered, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him, and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. I do know, I covered that. I am. That's God's name from the Old Testament when Moses met him at the burning bush. I am that I am. Tell them that I am hath sent thee. And Jesus was identifying himself with that title. I am. Then they took up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by. Now uh, Genesis or excuse me John chapter 9. And as Jesus passed by he saw a man which was blind from his birth. 
which is every one of us. We're blind from our birth. The moment we're born, we are born into iniquity and sin. And the God of this world is, has blinded our eyes or blinded our minds. So we cannot see the truth. We are born into sin, born into transgression, born into iniquity. There's no way out of it. You don't have to learn how to do evil. You don't have to learn how to sin. Um, I remember in high school, I had a, an English teacher, Mrs. Sorensen, and I liked her. She was a good teacher. She was nice. Um, I knew she went to, I think it was the United Methodist Church, either in this town or somewhere, she went to a United Methodist Church. And she was teaching us about Henry David Thoreau's transcendentalism and, and trying to tell us that babies are not born evil. That all babies, all children are born good, but it's the evil parents that teach them bad things. Is that true? No. Oh. 1st time my children lied each one of them Lindsay was the first one first time that I can remember she lied I know why she lied she lied to keep herself from getting in trouble we asked her did you do this and she said no what well, we watched her do it okay and um, she lied to keep herself from getting in trouble is why she lied. So it was born into her, fashioned in iniquity, shapen in transgressions. That's how David described himself in Psalm 51. So I was born this way. The homosexual says I was born this way. He's partially right. He's born into sin. Born into depravity born into evil so we're born blind Jesus passed by he saw a man which was blind from his birth and his disciples asked him saying master who did sin this man or his parents that he was born blind now we touched on this I do remember us teaching on this for those who would say that all physical illnesses are the result of sin and that if you confess the sin and rid it out of your life then you will no longer have a sickness or an illness that's a lie because they asked Jesus that that exact question here's this man he was blind from his birth so whose sin caused him to be blind? Was it his sin or his parents' sin? And Jesus is like, why does it have to be anybody's sin? Jesus answered, neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now, let's stop for a minute. If you have real, if you've come to the age, if you've come to the age of realizing just how sinful you really are, if you've come to that point, to where you look back now on a life full of serious regrets. Looking back on things that you did and just shudder in horror that you did those things. And yet God saved you.
When you look back then and ask the question, God, why did you let me get into that sin? God, why did you let me go that far? God, why did I waste so many years wandering astray? God, why in the world did you call me and perfect me and choose me and forgive me and love me? God, why did you do that? I remind you that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. I will remind you that Jesus is not ashamed to call us brethren. And when the people are asking, why is this man blind? Is it because of his own sin or the sin of his parents? Jesus said, it's not for anybody's sin. But I'm going to show you the reason why this man is born this way. Is because God knew that I was going to come along and our paths were going to cross today right in front of all of you. And I'm going to heal him of his blindness. And you're going to know then, you're going to know now that I am of God. Because I, I'm the one who not only created the eye, I'm the one who can recreate the eye. Reminds me of a vacuum cleaner salesman. I tried my hand at that once. Vacuum cleaner salesman. And you know the old spiel, they used to go into people's houses and uh, a lot of times they would have a bag of dirt and dump it on their carpet and then get their vacuum cleaner out and suck it all up and you look at it and go, it's a miracle! This vacuum cleaner cleaned up all that filthy dirt! And then you, you know, you get to make the sale. So this vacuum cleaner salesman was out in a country area, houses all spread apart, hadn't met his sale in two or three days, he's getting really desperate, goes out to this farmhouse, pulls all of his vacuum cleaner stuff out and his bag of dirt, walks up to the front door, asks the lady, said, ma'am, can I, can I come in and show you how this, how this thing operates and how this works? And she said, but, but I don't know. He said, but ma'am, just give me a few minutes. And he comes in with the vacuum cleaner, pulls out that bag of dirt, dumps it all over her carpet. And she starts screaming. What are you doing? And he said, now ma'am, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. And she said, and I know what you're thinking too. You think I have electricity. That's the end of the joke. That was the punchline. I'll be here all week. Yeah. The point of that was vacuum cleaner salesman's got to make it dirty before he can clean it up. Of course, nowadays, nowadays, vacuum cleaner salesmen don't have to carry a bag of dirt around with them. They walk into houses. Ugh. Yeah, I move on. Um, Jesus answered, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Psalm 146, 8, the Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. That is what God does. He does it. He does it every day. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous. How many of you ever read something in the Bible several times? And then one time you read it again. And all of a sudden God shows you something in that passage that you never saw before. And could have swore it was never there. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. The Lord raised... That was the... That was... When, when people come to me and ask me, you know, Pastor, what, how do I get people to, you know, get hook, hooked into the King James? How do I get them onto the King James? 
I don't have the words to give them. I don't have them. The, the simple fact is if God doesn't open their eyes to it, they will not convert to it. It's that simple. Okay? Now, if, if I was your... My mom laughed at that joke. It's a minute late, but it's... Or maybe it took her that long to get it. Yeah. So anyway, what was I going to say? Thanks, Mom. Oh, I lost my train. Yeah. Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. I don't remember what I was going to say. What was the last thing I said? Huh? Lord, why'd you give me these people? What were you thinking? Yeah, I don't remember. That's probably God's way of saying, Mike, shut up. Yeah. Isaiah 29, 18, In that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. I was talking about the Bible issue. And if God doesn't open your eyes to the Bible, okay, I remember now what I was going to say. As a pastor, I could, I could lay down rules and guidelines that I would insist that everybody follow. And we've had pastors like that in the past. Pastors who would say, I want to see all the ladies wearing, ladies should wear dresses everywhere they go. And I don't want to see any of my church women out going to Walmart in their blue jeans. I think my ladies in, in, in this church are to wear dresses everywhere they go and, and institute these guidelines that he says everybody must follow in order to, and it basically it's in order to please the pastor. Now, ladies, is there anything wrong with wearing a dress? No, it's feminine. It's very feminine. God designed it that way. Is there, is there anything wrong with a man wearing a dress? Obviously, yes. Okay? Uh, same thing with hair. God put it in our nature, men, to want to have short hair. I just, I just got mine buzzed. Thank God last week. I got healthy enough to get my hair cut. It was getting to where I don't like it. I just, I never did. I grew up in the 70s and didn't like long hair then. I don't like it now. It's in our nature. But the bottom line is, if a preacher, and I've seen this happen in this church, a pastor would institute guidelines for, that he wants everybody to follow, and then all of a sudden, everybody's doing what the pastor told him to. But when that pastor leaves that church, what happens to everybody? The ladies start putting their jeans back on, and it, that's just how it is. But if God convicts you of something, if God opens your eyes to something and says, this is how you are, and this is how I want you to be, if God does it to you that way, all of a sudden now, it's, it, it's, you're going to change, and the change is permanent. Nobody can talk you out of it. Nobody can convince you of it. Nobody can, nobody can slick talk you into some other way. Nobody can and that's not legalism, that's not bondage, that's not work salvation. It is letting the Holy Ghost lead you on how he wants you to live your life. Um, Isaiah 35, 3. Man, it's getting late. But anyway, strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense and he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Isaiah 42, 6. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and, I, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. The same God that can open the eyes of the blind can set the captives free out of prison. Was not Paul blinded on his, way, on his way to Damascus? And yet God not only opened his eyes, but later on, here's Paul and Silas in jail, in prison. 
And what happens? God opens the doors of the prison and Paul, they just walk out. Un, un, broke their chains, walked out, free men. When God makes you free, you're free. Amen? That's what God does. Anything in go to God. Go to God and say, God, what is it that others see in me that I don't see? What is it about me that is not right with you? It's not that I want to conform to what everybody expects of me. Don't be that way. You will be in constant bondage to everybody you're around if you try to conform to what everybody demands of you. But say to God, God, if there's something in me that's not right and you see it, God, will you show it to me and then help me correct it? Because I want to be more in your image every single day. You go to God with that. God will help you do it. Amen. Amen.